Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Get early access to all of our interviews, including the monthly Chichester chats with writer and comic book legend DG Chichester, new episodes of classic Capes and Lunatics shows, including The Quantum Zone, This That or the Third, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes, or go to patreon.com slash capesandlunatics. Hope to see you there. Welcome back to another episode of the Capes of Lunatics. I am Phil. Uh, I am the only uh, host here this time, but that's all right because You're not alone. Oh, not me. I mean, not my just regular crew. But I have an extra special guest, uh, Mr. Travis Ritchie, who you probably know from every other show on television uh, at some point or another. Uh, A couple of shows. <laughs> I said. I said every other show on television, probably. Oh please! Well, I, I please you you say you said you were looking at my origin. I was looking at your IMDb. I mean, I was scrolling. I mean, we could spend the episode just going through your uh, resume here, sir. I have done a good number of things, but I would say only a couple things that people actually watched. Uh, but you know, that's a lucky thing for an actor to be able to say they were on shows that people watched and liked. So that was pretty good. Um, Do you want to tell people what it was in case they don't know? Oh, I mean, I I know you're on Community, uh, Pretty Little Liars. I saw uh, the events. Uh, is there Are any... you familiar with the event? Um, I've seen the commercials. It's on my list. You know how you know in the age of streaming, everyone has that list. They're like, okay, I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to this. The event is like you one of the ones. You don't have I'm... to. It's it's a it was a it was a fun promise of a show that uh, <laughs> didn't materialize into an actual satisfying show really unfortunately it was one of those in the wake of lost uh, mm-hmm. everybody wanted the next big you know big mystery show and the problem with the event one of my favorite roles uh because i get shot in the back of the head uh after <laughs> after the opening credit or after the opening scene uh but the um no they never said what the event was like in my personal view as a as a writer too after the pilot episode you should know what the event is right like after the pilot episode of lost you know that they're lost you know uh and you know at the in the in the premiere of the event there, this airplane transports itself to another place and, it's like, and you're like is that the event <laughs> is alien contact the event is the appearance of this alien planet in orbit around the earth the event it could be but anyway I mean, do you need the, I mean, do you need the origin of stuff like that? Because I mean, look how, I mean, The Walking Dead, they don't tell you how the zombie apocalypse happens. It just no, happens. No, but you and, do, you, the title has the premise of the show. Yes. It, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a real, that proves my point. Thank you. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so so you said something about my origin in podcasting, so... Yeah, well, I noticed that uh, in your podcast description, it says that you were a, uh, a Flash and uh, Arrow uh, podcast, and my... So, I have two things that lead up to... One thing that leads up to that, but my very first big success as an actor was auditioning and getting a callback for Lex Luthor in Smallville. Ooh! Back before I ever moved to LA, I was living in uh, I was living in Minneapolis, and I guess they did a big wide search, and uh, that was pretty cool. Wow! Uh, and then I actually got called in to audition for Barry Allen in The Flash. Really? And so uh, yeah, which was really cool because I was thinking at the time, and I think they were doing a broad search, uh, and, and certainly I was too old for what they ended up casting Ooh. him as. But I was thinking at the time that they were going for more of a, uh, you know, a, a John Wesley ship type. 
uh, which was one of my favorite shows growing oh, up. Oh, me too. Yeah. Flash. Yeah. So um, that's what I was thinking, and I was super excited about it, but uh, they didn't um, end up going with it. And I was really bummed that they never gave me like another role in the show somewhere. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, what, you got to, to any of the uh, villains they introduced? Or right? Yeah. I would love to have been a villain, especially with the you know the community cred. I was, I, I was hoping that, that might uh, parlay <laughs> itself. The, the problem with the, that is shortly after I did the uh, back-to-back recurrings on Pretty Little Liars and Community, my agent killed herself. And, oh, um, as, uh, and my career stalled completely for a number of years, so... Um, so yeah, that was, I think that put the kibosh on me really making good use of that momentum, unfortunately. <laughs> Did we start this off on a bad note? I, I, I don't know. I just don't, I, I mean, I know why we're here. I mean, we're here. Life because... is full of tragedy and it's all about how we react to it, right? Yes. Uh, I feel, I have not stopped myself. And, uh, and, and one of the reasons I'm here is I've, I've parlayed a lot of my energy into writing. And, uh, and so I guess, uh, We'll talk about my book eventually. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes, of course. Uh, oh, but the one thing I did want to ask you, I did see on your resume. So you do some stand up too, correct? Yeah. Back in the day, most of my focus has been sketch and improv. Uh, mm-hmm. But I did for about a year stand up, uh, performed at the Laugh Factory and uh, Flappers and uh, a couple of places in L.A. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Have I have, a good, have yeah. a good tight 10. I've always thought I always thought that would be interesting to do, but I'm like I don't think I could come up with an act. I don't, you know, and then just the memorization, especially with the nerves once you're up there. Oh, you're wrong. Well, first of all, the thing that people think of is that you know, uh, stand up is more um, cont- uh, 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 what's the word? Not contemporaneous. Yeah, but in the way that I mean, like contemporaneous speaking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where you're just kind of off the cuff. It is generally very scripted, and like when you watch a good stand up, like. Uh, you know, John Mulaney is one of my favorites. All the little ticks and quirks that he has in his routine, they're all scripted <laughs> and rehearsed and practiced. And so, um, uh, yeah, I think you could probably do it. And the other thing about stand up is that the best stand ups talk about personal stuff, mm-hmm. right? And so everybody has personal stuff. And uh, it's about finding the personal stuff for you that other people can relate to. And uh, therein lies the funny. I mean, I have a wife and child, but again, I, I could just see this stand up act. As Nobody except, has. Who has children? I know, I, mean, I know. But not, I was going to say, no, no, and me, it would come down to, well, there's this funny thing happened on the podcast the other day, or, you know. Well, there, I mean, there's something funny about that, about a stand up who's like, uh, his whole thing is. Cause, because the truth is, everybody has podcasts. I have a podcast. I mean,. To be fair to myself, I was podcasting back in 2006. Wow. When it really meant putting it on an iPod, but <laughs> um, uh, which is where the name comes from, everybody, if you didn't know. But uh, yeah, no, I was, uh, I have, I currently do a podcast with a friend of mine called Exposing Ourselves, which uh, is pretty nice because I do love uh, a slight innuendo in a title. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, most of mine, I mean, it's nice when we get to interviews. A lot of mine, we do, we talk about, well, superheroes mostly, a lot of po- mm-hmm. uh, comic books, uh, you know, when there's a new movie out, t- you know, we talk about TV shows and stuff. But Yeah, yeah. I am a giant. Uh, comic books are one of my origin stories. Oh, really? Uh, they, yeah, I started collecting comics but when Superman died. Um, and uh, around the same time as uh, Superman number 500, I was in a gas station. I was probably 13 or 14, and I saw uh, an issue of Spider-Man 2099. I think it was issue number eight. And that combined my childhood love of Spider-Man and my my sci-fi love. And I was like, oh, my God, this comic is made for me. And it was written by Peter David, who mm-hmm. has, you know, I had already read a bunch of his other stuff. Like, yes. uh, I was already into Star Trek, and he wrote, I think, Gamzati and a couple other Star Trek novels. Mm-hmm. So I was like, this comic book is made for me. And uh, and it was all over from there. I, I just went crazy. Every dollar I got, every gift I got was, please give me comic books. <laughs> uh, and I spent much of, my, through college, I spent much of my student loans. Anything that didn't go to classes or room and board went to comic books. And um, so I, I, I almost looked up my, uh, my, tried to find my collection because I was very fastidious about keeping track of all the comics I own. Yeah. And I have a document somewhere that lists them all out. 
uh, but I haven't seen that in. You know what? I, I I I've for years I've been scanning everything I have. I keep it on a separate hard drive, just like a scan of the cover and stuff. But there is an app oh, now wow. where you can just you know you, t- you just like take a picture of the barcode or whatever. Yeah, and I just have there's yeah, an there's app apps can, for everything now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I was uh, I my my collection ended uh, at a time that predated apps. Oh yeah. You know what? Yeah, we sound we sound about the same age. Yeah, I started collecting when I was ten. I think you know my mother was just like you know, oh, at least he's reading something, and I, you know, and now it's just grown to the point it has it's never stopped for me. So now it's at the point where my wife's like, "There's too many comic books in the basement." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." I'm like, I'm like there could be never be enough. My my parents were not as understanding, unfortunately, because I was up to that date uh, an avid reader mm-hmm. of of book books. And uh, so, you know, I was reading things like The Hobbit at age seven and Lord of the Rings at 10 and, you know, stuff. Well, trying to read Lord of the Rings at 10. God, what a wordy book. Uh, But the uh, but I loved like Stephen King and and Michael Crichton and those kind of things when I was, uh, you know, late Mm -hmm. single digits. And um, and so my parents didn't understand the 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 perceived downgrade to comic books. And uh, uh, yeah. I never told. I, I, I became friends uh, with Len Wein in the years before he died, which was kind of a, an amazing thing for me as a comic mm. book nerd. Like I was invited once because of the Inspector Space Time thing. I went to a convention and ended up meeting Melinda Snodgrass, who was a uh, writer on Star Trek Next Generation. So I, of course, knew who she was. And we started talking and she invites me to a party at Len Wein's house. Oh, wow. And, you know, yeah, my first reaction was like, no, not, not that Len Wein. And she's like, yeah, 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 that Len Wein. Uh, creator of Wolverine and Swamp Thing and many <laughs> other beloved comic book characters. Uh, and so I went to Len's house for a summer party and everyone was there. Like the 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 executive producers from Batman the Animated Series and uh, wow. Bear McCreary's over there, uh, you know, talking about doing the music for Battlestar Galactica and, you know, uh, uh, so many people that I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm meeting you. <laughs> and and then like Len's wife starts talking to me and she's like, um, her name is Chris. She's brilliant. She's like a, a Jeopardy champion. And. She goes, uh, hey, we do this uh, supper for, you know, L.A. orphans. Uh, you should come. And I was thinking that it was one of those L.A. offers. I don't know if you know L.A. people, but they're, they're a lot of, you know, there's this thing where you're like, oh, we should totally hang out. And uh, and then you never do. Uh, but then they followed up with me and they're, and they're like, are you coming to dinner? And I was like, yes, I guess I am. Wow. So then I was eating dinner at their place every Sunday for years. Wow. And, and then Len died. and. Wow. So I'm actually doing Thanksgiving there uh, this year. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, that would be me. You know, if I ever got any kind of fame, they'd be like, you know, do you want to meet the a- say lister? I'd be like, no, you know, I want to meet like, you know, Brian Michael Bendis or something. I don't know. You know, just I'd be like, I name know, right? comic writers are the best, man. Oh, oh yeah. Writers. Oh, yeah. I mean, some I've talked to so many creators like, you know, like so people from the 90s. Like I talked to Peter David, you know. Oh, I would love to meet him. Uh, Brian Azzarello is a favorite. Yes. I've never met him. Yes. Uh, I got his autograph once, but that doesn't count. I mean, once a month, one of my co-hosts and I talked to D.G. Chichester, who wrote Daredevil for a few years in the 90s, like every month. And I'm like, 14-year-old me's head would have exploded if I would have known. I talk about 14-year-old me all the time. Yes. Uh, a lot of times in conjunction with, like, I'm an actor, and I've done some fun stuff, but I am by no means a famous actor and I'm not really what I would consider to be a, a huge success or anything, but I will remind myself that 14 year old me would go crazy over the things that I've done. Like, you know, the, I have been on TV. I've, I've, you know, my YouTube channel has been viewed by like not a huge amount by YouTube standards, but I got about 4 million views and like, that means 4 million people have seen my YouTube stuff. Like that's crazy to me. Exactly. And, I have to remind myself of those victories, you know, when I'm picking up a second job at wherever uh, to pay the bills after a, after a grueling uh, and hard fought actors and writer strike. I, I must say. Oh uh, yeah, the the writer strike. I mean, it's I mean, it's sad. We have to wait for a lot of our favorite movies and TV shows, but you know, I know we've all like, you know what? It's worth it. Let these people get paid what they deserve. It was existential this time, really. I mean, it, we were talking about having a system that that allows people to even make a living. And uh, if you can't make a living, then, I mean, the quality of the work certainly goes down. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I for what I heard, it isn't even just like you know people were just struggling to get hours to get you know so they get paid health care and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's wonderful to like so many of us want to be creative people and and have a job as a creator, um, but the ability to make a living as such is is really is really tough. So, you know, I'm still hoping for that Star Trek future uh, where just everybody can do what they're passionate about. Uh, they're going to say no, no money in uh, fancy jumpsuits. Uh, well, yeah, no, because because money doesn't matter, right? That's yes. why they, everybody can do what they what they are passionate about, right? You know, if mm. you want to go make wine, go make wine. If you want to be an artist, be an artist. If you want to explore the stars, do that in a you know paramilitary organization. <laughs> yeah, and, and then one of the other issues I think for the strike, I mean, there's new stuff that came up. With, I mean, wasn't AI part of it? Where it's you know just like let's hammer well, hammer that's, out that's what the essential you know. part? Yeah. Yeah, because they're, what they're doing is they're trying to get uh, and when it's so and and you know college students are doing it already where they're trying they're writing stories and and essays using ChatGPT or whatever and uh, and I have tried playing around with ChatGPT and trying to uh, you know say hey uh, tell me a story about this and then you say uh, now do it in the style of Shakespeare and then you you know you can refine these things and and they're not good right but they're impressive. And someday they may be good. And you know that studios would much rather pay nothing to have a computer write a script than pay, you know, a writer X amount of do- any amount of dollars really to to do that script. And so that's why uh, that's why I thought that I say that the fight this summer was existential for for creatives, for writers and actors, especially. Um, and they want to replace they, you know, and they were already you may have heard this, uh, they would take a background actor, for example, hire them for a day, scan them in this 3D oh, camera rig, yeah, do they, and, yeah. ex- and, and make them, make the actor sign over the use of their likeness for all time for no money. <laughs> so it's like, well, there goes, you know, and, and, and the vast majority of actors who make a living do so by doing background work. You can actually make enough to make health and pension and uh and, and like and, and a pension doing background work. Well, yeah, I mean, luckily, I think yeah, people are 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 waking up to you know what the higher ups like to try to do. Because I mean, like our passion comic books. I mean, the creators of Superman. I mean, they died basically penniless. You know, but like broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's what that the I think it's important for society in general to to see the importance of uh, creative people before they die. Yes. Um, and you know we do have our our i our idols our celebrities, but they are the you know the one percent of the one percent of the entire population yeah. of creative professionals. So yeah, I think I think some some of us who aren't in the industry and yeah, you know, I think the awareness you know the strike helped raise awareness because. I think some people in this country thought, oh, well, if you're, you know, attached in any way to any movie or TV show, you must be you must be making some good money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, and, not, and, not always the and, case most of the time. Well, what is true? So, for example, I this is and I'll be candid about this, but like my best year of television was uh, I shot five episodes of television, which is great. Um, but you get paid, let's say about a, like a little under a thousand dollars, but let's say a thousand dollars for five episodes of television. That's five thousand dollars. That's not enough to live on, mm. you know. And uh, you can get residuals. So I've probably, uh, I've probably gotten maybe three thousand dollars total for each episode of Community that I've that I shot, mm. um, which is great because you have some some longevity after the uh, after you've shot something. Uh, but like, and you look at these older actors who are on a TV show for seven years, but then can't get cast in anything because no, everybody knows them as the mom from growing pains and they can't do anything else well joanna Kearns is national treasure that's a bad example but um you know what i mean and and then they they depend on their residuals in their old age to to survive to actually live and so residuals have gotten decimated in the age of streaming oh really i thought i was gonna say did it go i thought maybe it would go up i mean no because back when streaming started uh, actors negotiated a contract and the streaming company said, this is experimental. We don't know if it's going to work. We need you actors to, to really help us make this work by not charging us for residuals. 
And the actors were like, okay, but, you know, only until we see if it works or not. And, of course, now there's no DVD sales. There's no home video at all. It's all streaming. And there's some network television and there's some cable. But streaming is pretty much it. And uh, there are almost no residuals. I shot a uh, episode of television last year for a streaming service, and I got paid uh, a little larger than my um, than my base rate, which is you know about a thousand dollars that we talked about. So I got paid fifteen hundred dollars for an episode, hmm. uh, but no residuals. So that's the entire. And they didn't pay for things like costume fittings and uh, you know uh, table reads and things that you would normally get paid for on like another show just by earning the base rate so hmm. yeah streaming is a um uh a racket so for, i mean for the studios and so that's what that's another big thing we were fighting for so if we contract that's sorry uh, for, no i was yeah. gonna say no if we, so if we just want to help with, with residuals pick up the blu-rays pick up the dvds then if you if you i, I don't even own a blu-ray player so oh. I mean, you know if anybody's like me that's not really even an option i mean i um, mean yeah i need to, i know if i'd love something enough i want to get it on blu-ray and uh you know because again with streamers you never know where they're going to pull it you know it's just yep. any time they i pull. know right that's the other thing like whole shows are getting canceled when when the promise of streaming was that like you'll have the entire catalog at your disposal it'll all be up there forever yeah yeah but that's not the case we're learning and, mm-hmm. and and movies that are actually made can get canceled without ever being seen just for the tax write off. Exactly. You know, it's all it's all the, the business of of it is kind of gross in a way. Uh it, it takes away the creative aspect and, and I don't know. It's a uh, it's it's difficult. It's a it's a tough time to be yeah. creative. Yeah. And, and uh, this this actor's contract that we just got is um is pretty good it's a good improvement on what we were uh on what we had but it's not by any means addressing all the things that we really hoped to address but so but it's a good start it's a tricky one yeah it's a good start you know so right now all the actors are deciding whether to vote for it and there's there is massive discussions going on 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 both yes and no right now it's heated Hmm. uh, if you're in any of these actor uh conversations that i'm in Hmm. So, like, how long, I mean, again, I know nothing about the industry. Like, how long yeah. are, like, these, how long, how often do they negotiate these things? About every three years. Oh, okay. uh, most of the kind, con- I think, I think everything that I know of, the writers, the directors, the actors are all three-year contracts. And, um, and the actors have different contracts for different things. So, for film and television, there's one contract. For commercials, there's another contract. For daytime television, uh, there's another contract. Um and so, uh, like the 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 net code uh, or network code agreement, which is which covers like daytime talk shows and stuff like that, uh, doesn't come around until next year. So mm. that wasn't up for renegotiation, which is why people like Drew Barrymore were going to go back to work uh, without the writers because they were still under a valid SAG contract, mm-hmm. uh, but they got backlash for not including their writers. Hmm. You know what? I've always thought. I've thought the last couple of years. I'm like, well, you know what? We need some kind of talk show where it's like, it's it's like nerd pop culture. It's like comics, movies, TV. You know, someone just hosting the show. I mean, maybe you, maybe you, the man to do it. But I'm just, yeah. Well, I would, I would love to do something like that. And uh, I'll bet it would be an, I'll bet it would get an audience. And I feel like if you look at some of the cable channels like G4 and uh, and those kind of things, they were doing stuff like that yeah right? and youtube is a great source for that so i wonder if maybe the more tech savvy people that we're aiming for would even watch a show on television you know yeah i mean yeah do, you, do it on a streamer do it somewhere because i mean just well, uh I, I mean even if it's just you know you do humorous takes explain like you know the mcu to you know the the average movie going fan yeah you know, who has never read a well, comic before yeah, that's that's a similar. I mean, I, so what my podcast not to not to be self promoting, but no, my please. podcast uh, exposing ourselves is a similar concept. Not necessarily about nerd stuff specifically, but like I'm a big movie buff, and my friend from college is a big music fan, uh, but he doesn't watch movies, and I don't listen to music. <laughs> so what we do is we assign each other oh. a thing that we don't know. Every week. So he gives me a band to listen to. I give him a movie to watch. And then we come together to discuss it on the podcast. So we could easily do something like that with, um, you know, nerdy stuff, comics or. Uh, 
or or or, you know, or, or, ha- or have we all killed that idea because it's like uh, we all have podcasts now so it's like oh well that's part of the if other you have if, you, right? if you're looking for something or you have a specific interest there's a podcast whatever, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, my difficulty my my little challenge is that my co-host has has already said that he doesn't like uh superhero movies uh, which I'm like I'm like I'm supposed to be giving you my favorite movies and I can't give you superhero movies <laughs> like I tried so early on he let it slip that he really loved the Incredibles and he loves animation so I'm like aha here's my chance mm. and so I slipped him uh I gave him I assigned him uh Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse right oh, which yeah. is an Academy Award winning yes animated film and it happens to be a perfect movie and uh and he hated it Really? Like, I thought it was my in, uh, but he hated it and I huh. I was I was a little devastated. You should listen to that episode. It's uh <laughs> my my devastation is palpable. Wow. But um and so from then on, uh I have I have been very very wary about diving back into the superhero um genre. I did we did just talk about Dread, which was oh. which was interesting. He didn't love it, but he didn't hate it. Hmm. Um, and that is technically a superhero. Oh, it's a comic book movie. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I'm, 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 I'm yeah, wearing them down. The, the, I mean, the tide has kind of shifted because I don't know. I mean, you probably experienced this. I know when I like was in high school and some people were like, ew, you read comic books. Why do you read comic books? Now it's like, you know, you walk into work and it's just like, oh, hey, did you see the new Marvel movie? What was that? What was that? You know, everyone's asking me questions. What was that? You know, yeah. what was this character? What was that? What was that? But let me ask you this. When you were a kid, didn't you know already? You're like, but nerds rule the world. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Like I, I was fairly comfortable with it. I was like, I don't care. You, you dumb jock, aren't you know? You're not gonna, you're not gonna have much longevity. You're gonna be stuck in this town when I'm off. You know, being in Hollywood. It's just read something. <laughs> read one. Yeah, yeah. You just try it out. Well, and the thing is, you know, even then, I was looking back at um, like uh, the movie that made me passionate about movies was uh, Terminator Two. Oh, like when I saw that, it just switched something in my brain and i was just obsessed and but i looked back and prior to that if you looked at the 10 highest grossing movies of all time eight of the 10 were all Mm sci-fi you know you were all you it was all the et and star wars and you know back to the future and those kind of movies so um so i was pretty comfortable with my nerddom yeah i mean sci-fi it makes you think i mean it makes you think in different ways yeah yeah, that's why I love Star Trek. I mean, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not unforgiving of its shortcomings, which have been, um, you know, we've had a hard stretch where there wasn't much good Star Trek, and even then, when we got Star Trek, it was only okay. Yeah. Uh, but luckily now, I think is a uh, is a great time. We've got uh, Lower Decks and uh. Uh, Strange New Worlds, which are fantastic, yes. and really are both kind of going back to the roots of Star Trek, where you're talking about you can have dialogue, you can have people talking to each other. Um, man, man, some of those old Next Gen and, and Deep Space Nine episodes, even Voyager, y- you don't get that anymore. That kind of like two people talking about a dilemma yeah. and working it out, and like. Mm. I love that kind of writing. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I love I love Next Gen and Voyager, but oh god, that first season and Next Generation. Ugh. Yeah, it was finding its footing and yes. they were dealing with a lot, you know. But uh, I was I was watching a video recently about those skorts, those uh, those u- dress uniforms. Oh yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah that they the had first the men season, wearing yeah. too. Um, those did those were not long for this world, but uh, Lower Decks has them. Which, <gasps> <laughs> this is why I love Lower Decks, man. They do not leave any pebble unturned. Oh, no. I, I mean, are you caught up on Lower Decks? Yeah. I mean, yeah. they ended the season on Nick Lacarno. I was like, you bring in Robert, Robert Duncan McNeil and I yep. would be Nick Lacarno. Yeah, yeah. I, I love I love that. So, good show. Good show. Yeah, so let's get, let's get Travis on there. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I happen to know someone who's one of the series regulars, and I was like, oh, nice. I was like, I, I want to. I, I don't want to like ruin our our very kind of casual friendship by being like, "Hey, can you please give me a give me a like put me into the casting voice casting whatever." Uh, I would love to do a cart. I would love to do animation. I, I've been doing some anim- uh, animation auditions. Oh, a lot of them in the last couple nice. of years. Just it's a tough, oh, tough yeah. business to break into. So. 
because I mean, you we'll get, see. I mean, so, I mean, the good, you know, the, the good voice actors, I mean, they take what, like 20, jo- you know, they, they'll do like 20 jobs if you can do different voices. Yeah. Yeah. And fortunately I've been getting auditions for the same shows. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, that's always a good sign when the casting director brings you back. Oh, uh, so. Cause I mean that, I mean, that, I mean, that's good. That's good working if you get it right. Cause I mean, oh, yeah. as long as your yeah. voice maintains, I mean, you could do that the rest of your life. Oh God. Yeah. I met Nancy Cartwright at a, a show, uh, that I did, uh, a few months ago and who, and she's delightful. She's just wonderful. But like, I'm looking at her and I'm like, wow, you're Bart Simpson and you make a <laughs> million dollars per episode. And like you've been doing it for is, 30 some years <laughs> and you've been doing it for 30 years. What is your life like? Like what? Who? What are you like? What? I just want to like know you. Um, but yeah, she was a wonderful person to meet. I know that that whole thing is crazy because I'm trying to get my son into watching The Simpsons. I said, I'm like, it's been on since I was like your age. It's, it's, it's nuts. Is that crazy? Yeah, right? I know. To be, you know, but you know what? It, it's not that much of a slog because, uh, you only really have to watch the first 10 seasons. After that, it's <laughs> the occasional Halloween episode. Yeah. I, I haven't watched it in a while. So yeah, but neither have I. I, I tune in every few years to be like, is it funny now? Oh, no, it's not funny now. Uh, all right, so all right, I've held I've held you off long enough. All right, so the reason we are here, kids, is Travis has a new book uh, out. So tell them about it. it's a vampire book. I I love vampires. Do you really? So yes. Do I. I'm a I am what I call an equal opportunity nerd. I uh, I am I love all sorts of nerddom without being super obsessive about any one kind. So, but uh, I've always loved vampires. I think they are a really cool. Um, what do you call them? species uh genre i guess anyway but the uh i have seen vampires done well and i've seen them done awfully and what i did is i came up with a a concept for a vampire story back in 2009 Hmm. and i originally was going to do it as a movie and the big change i wanted to make to the mythology was to make vampires more realistic so make them more biology based and um and like you know, kind of rooted in our world, right? So uh, the first thing I took away was anything supernatural. They can't yeah. fly. My vampires can't turn into mist or transmogrify into an animal or uh, they're not, uh, they have reflections. Crosses do nothing because crosses are just things. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that was step one. The second thing I did was I was, uh, I'm I'm gay and, uh, or queer. Um, and I have, often been given thought to the idea that um that the percentage of gay people in the world uh is about one in ten you know that's an old kind of estimate and now we know it's more of a it's more of a spectrum and so it's hard to delineate numbers like that but that one in ten numbers stayed with me and uh and so the book is called decimus which is latin for ten and the uh so that's how you remember it folks (laughs) And, uh, well, actually, the series is called Decimus. We renamed it when we put it out because my publisher was like, uh, so this is going to be a series, right? I was like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, it, it's it's the book is called The Vampire's Curse. Uh, it's the plural possessive of vampires um, for the grammar nerds out there. And uh, the so the other big change I made to the to the mythology is that when a vampire turns a human, it happens in the same way that you do on True Blood or or uh, Interview with a Vampire or whatever. You know, a vampire drains a human of all their blood, gives them some vampire blood, and poof, they're a vampire, right? In my universe, that only works about one in ten times. Oh, the other ninety percent of the time, the human dies, right? And uh, and that has to do with you know that's just like I was t- I was thinking about well if it's if it's essentially a a, a contagion, right? It's mm-hmm. a some sort of viral something, or or that you're passing on to your 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 from host to victim. Yeah, you're basically um, changing, like radically altering the person's exactly. DNA it and stuff. Yeah, it's, to me, it didn't make sense that it would that it would work every time. And so, uh, and especially if I was taking away the supernatural, then you're talking more biology. And I was like, aha! But that opened up a huge uh, kind of pandora's box of drama when you talk about a vampire that falls in love with a human Mm. because then what do you do do you risk it yeah do you risk it 
Or do you live with that person and have a life together but have to watch them grow old and die like the oh, Highlander? Oh, nice. Or do you send them away and, and then spend your life alone? Especially if you're a gay vampire because then the vampire race, because of this, uh, they call this kind of um, one in ten dilemma decimus. That's what they refer to it. Um, but you've got this one in ten dilemma. And so the vampires are fairly rare in this earth. And then you're a gay vampire, which so you're one in ten of that already rare population. So you're pretty alone. Hmm. So if you happen to find love, sometimes you're powerless to act against it, right? Yeah, because so, I, I mean, uh, I, yeah, I like this because you know that's the rap on some of these other like vampire stories. They're like, oh, why are they so down and depressed? You know, they can just make a a companion and you know live eternity, you know, live forever and yes, stuff. You've and got it's the just, world to choose from. Yes, I like this where it's like, yeah, the process is not so easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um so that's my story and it centers around uh you know the main protagonist is also gay and was originally going to be something I would have cast myself in back in 2009 uh but I'm uh, I'm aged out of the role now. Uh, I would play the villain. There's a really cool villain Ooh. character uh who I won't ruin, but uh he uh he's pretty cool. So uh yeah, it's got it's it's I like the book. I'm I'm I have always been a writer. But I've never been a writer first. You know, if, if if someone made me choose between being an actor and being a writer, I would choose being an actor. Uh, but uh, I've always loved being a writer. Uh, I wrote my first two scripts that I ever wrote back in high school were spec scripts for Star Trek Voyager. Oh, so, um, that, uh, that stands for speculative script. So you write a script. And at the time, Star Trek was one of the only shows that allowed mm-hmm. uh, anybody to send in a spec script. So they would read your script. And uh, and they made a lot of those just scripts sent in by fans. And yeah, a lot okay. of people like, you know, the Ron Moores of the world, the Rene Echevarria and, you know, those kind of people came to Star Trek by sending in a spec script. Yeah, I thought I heard it wasn't like the last season of Next Gen with some spec scripts people sent in. I oh, thought, probably. I, th- yeah, I thought they had used some of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they used them from from. I think they started that process maybe season three. Oh, uh, but they they were doing that the whole time. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, Deep Space Nine had a bunch, and uh, yeah. Okay, like I said, I love Voyager. Who's your favorite Voyager character? Uh, Voyager, I would have to go with the Doctor. Uh, oh, uh, nice. You know what? I do love Janeway. Uh, she's she's a badass, and especially knowing that we uh, avoided getting uh, Genevieve Bougeau as, as Janeway uh, to get um, ah Kate Mulgrew. Yes. Uh, oh, man, Kate Mulgrew. Oh, yeah. Just nailed that role like oh, she yeah. knew what genre she was in she knew that character uh needed to be she knew what it needed to be but um but i'm a big fan of the doctor uh, i've had an opportunity to work with uh uh robert picardo uh, oh, really? a couple of times yeah he's a great guy um if you so if you uh if you know community i played inspector space time on community we did a web series that is, uh, for legal reasons, not the Inspector Space Time web series. But if you search for Inspector Space Time web series, it's what you get. I can't help what Google does. But um, the uh, but Bob, uh, I call him Bob because Bob Picardo and I are yeah. friends now. Uh, no, but Robert, he goes by Bob. Uh, but Robert Picardo was in the um, the last episode of the web series that we shot, which was supposed to be kind of a proof of concept for the second season. Mm. Uh, which we never got funded, but then we decided to do a movie because then we could get investors instead of donors and like hopefully make some people some money. Um, Cause I hate asking people to donate to things, especially yeah. to web series because you're essentially asking them to donate to something that's going to be free for everybody. And then you have to make up all these incentives and perks and whatnot. It's, yeah. it's dumb, but to ask people to invest in a movie that will hopefully make the money. That's a, ne- a much easier sell. Hmm. Um, anyway, so Robert Picardo was in that, and he's he's great. Uh, I was hoping to have him be in the movie, but we never got the movie funded. No, oh. yeah, but that's the next book. Um, by the way, is coming out. Uh, that the the novelization of that movie oh. is with my editor right now. Oh wow! So yeah. So or so so are you an author now? I mean, do you are, are you feeling the I'm a are published you, author, dude? Yeah, I was I was it's gonna so say, weird. are you are you feeling it, or were you just like, I need to write another book, another book, another book? Well, that is the pressure. I mean, and I do feel that because now uh, I've got two series 
that I need to do. So I've got to do this Decimus series, uh, which is at least a four book series, and then the uh, the Inspector Chronicles series, which is at least a three book series. Um, so yeah, all that on my plate. Are and you- my publisher wants one per series per year, <laughs> <laughs> and and I got a lot of stuff to do. So, so are you writing those concurrently or are you just like, I go no, work on no. one and well, then the other? I mean, or? I'm always, I always have a dozen ideas floating around in my head mm-hmm. and I've got like, I've got like TV pilots I want to write and uh, all sorts of stuff. It's really finding the discipline to sit down and, uh, and do it. That's the problem. Um, and I find that really hard to do at home because there's too many distractions. Uh, I really love writing in a coffee shop. I think mm. that's, it, there's a reason that's a stereotype and it's because you kind of get this, white noise of activity around you that somehow helps you focus mm. so um but i did also adopt a, i don't you can't see her in the camera but she's uh, i adopted a dog uh, when the writer strike started so i've got her and so i don't want to leave her at home yeah so that makes things tough you know so if the if the uh if you become a if the author thing takes off would you ever give up acting or, or are you like no i'm an actor i'm always going to be doing something in acting mm. Well, if the author thing takes off, I would parlay that into ha- giving myself options for acting. So mm-hmm. I have, you know, things that I want to produce, have produced um, TV shows and web series. Uh, well, web series that should be TV shows. Um, I'm just shooting another one right now called Time Wrecked, which is a time travel comedy, oh. which is so good. And we just shot the first episode and we're hoping to use that to try to get funding for the rest of the season which may end up being a Kickstarter. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's really funny and should just be a show on Paramount Plus or wherever. Hmm. You know, I, Even though I just ragged on streaming services. <laughs> that's so. Hey, it's those, are who, those are the places that are taking risks right now. Yeah, that's a, we're pretty much the only game in town right now, huh? Yeah. yeah I mean, I don't know if the only game, but I feel like... I feel like One of the biggest th- right now. Networks yeah. and, and uh, even cable companies are have a hard time taking a risk on a relatively unknown creator like myself. Like, even though I've been around for ages and you can see all my stuff and you can see that it's got a fandom, um, you they're unlikely to take a risk on me unless I've already worked in a writer's room and worked my way up through that process. Hmm. But, you know, and maybe that's a possibility. I would take that. Like, if someone offered me a job, you know, on the writing staff for, say lower decks or you know Ooh. whatever um i would absolutely take that i mean i don't know with networks i don't know if it's just they, them taking chances on certain writers i think it just seems like it's so formulaic in networks now they're like do you either have a remake of an old show or do you have you know the 50th uh, new uh cop procedural show cop procedural yeah yeah there is i do think there's a little pressure that they're feeling uh to be original um, you're seeing some stuff on network. I guess I, I don't even know if I can say that. I I, I I have a hard time knowing what's network and what's not. Like, mm. uh, like what was on? I don't know. Like, well, it's so what weird. It's so weird because even the networks, it's kind of like you know, like NBC will have a show. The next day it'll be on Peacock. So it's kind of like both. Right, and then so if I'm watching it on Peacock, does it matter? Yeah, um, but yeah, I think that there is a. There is a uh, a push to be a little more inventive for network television in order to compete with the streamers and the Netflixes and uh, the Amazons, you know, uh, Apple TV. Apple TV, man, their content is freaking top notch, right? HBO used to be the used to be the, oh, yeah. the the place to go for high bar quality entertainment, but uh, you know, with the purchase with the purchase by Discovery. Um, I feel I think it's common belief that that has taken a little bit of a dive. Although um, you know HBO still has great stuff like uh, what's the what's the Pedro Pascal show? Uh, well, one, that was based on. A video I was going to say, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, oh, I know which one you're talking about too. Uh, the mushroom zombies. Yeah, I know. I took exactly. I, exact, I uh, yeah. Sil- some, why why can't I feel, why can't we figure out the name of this thing? Oh, I'm not, I have I It was the, the biggest game, show but, last year. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you said Pedro Pascal show. I was like, which one? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Here's the everything. Man, oh, the I Warrior. heard you guys talking about the Reed Richards thing. And yeah, the, uh, and whatever. I love Pedro Pascal so much, but I also want him in the things that are right for him. <laughs> yeah, do you think now it's like it's like they don't like? 
I don't want to say. I mean, he's a great actor, but it's like, is it, it's not that he's right for the role. It's that he's such a big name now that it's like we just want big maybe, names. Because sometimes that maybe. takes me out of it. Sometimes I want like a lesser known guy or woman yeah. who who I don't know, right. so I can be like, okay, that's Reed Richards instead of okay, I see Pedro Pascal on the screen in a Fantastic Four okay. costume. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that wholeheartedly because and and, and you know it, it almost doesn't matter. Like we 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 don't really have movie stars anymore. Right, so it doesn't matter as much who you cast as long as they're good. But I guess recognizable names are still valuable. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I guess that's just me being uh, uh, an unknown actor, being like, yeah, hire some unknown actors, right? Um, but uh, I, I don't know. I well, there is one example of a person who was miscast who ended up defining the role for generate for like. Decades. Do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, if I had to guess, I was going to say I, I know the guy who. I, again, this is probably personal experience from my childhood because I, just, I just loved him in this role. But I'm, I know if, when he first started, everyone was like Michael Keaton for Batman. That's never going to work. That was a, that's a really good example. Yeah, that was a lot of controversy about that. But I think Hugh might think of a different actor. Oh, yes, Wolverine, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, completely miscast for the role, right? Yeah, and now and now and and now now they're now everyone's like, bring him back, keep bringing him back, keep bringing him back, and then he drops back, over yeah. dead. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Hugh Jackman, uh, I think that's a great example of someone who you know he just he took ownership of the role and defined it for a for a generation, yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, so that's. That's a good. I just noticed that this is episode three one four. This is pie episode. This <laughs> yes, episode. yes. Huh, interesting. Uh, I, I, the number three zero four is my secret number, my little Easter egg number that you can find all throughout my, uh, my books and TV shows. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. All I'm, right, that was a tangent. I, I, I no, 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 no. I like I, your train of thought went off the tracks. You're like, <laughs> what is this guy talking about? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, no, I just feel bad now. I'm I'm gonna let you go here soon because I'm like he's got two books to write. He's probably he has some other projects he has to do. <laughs> Not tonight, I don't. Tonight, I am going to bed. I had a day on set today that was long, and uh, uh, Any, anything to you could talk about, or I, I, you know, is it gonna be one of those? I just have a day. I have a day job on a on a talk show. Um, oh, and uh, this we talked about extra work, and they had me. Um, they threw me a bone, and like they had a, they had an extra job available on the show so normally when i'm working on a show i'm a stand-in and uh, once the show starts i don't have to be there anymore so let me go so if they have like it's a holiday episode and they needed someone to play the gingerbread man and so uh, i mean you know savvy viewers will be able to figure out who it is uh last year i played a candy cane man and it went a little uh got a little memed because the costume for the candy cane was very revealing (laughs) Like, and it could, it was almost way worse. Uh, they they put me in this like like you know those cheap Halloween costumes that like their body suits. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. fabric and that like for a guy my size, it just it just shows everything. <laughs> and um and they were like uh they were like uh we can see your junk, so <laughs> we are going to have you wear a um a, a cup. And I'm like. I'm like, I don't know if that's a good idea. And so minutes before the show is airing, I'm getting dressed and they're like, okay, here's your dance belt and your cup and like put all this on. And I, I walk down and it, it is it is obscene, the bulge that this cup makes um, in the front of this costume. <laughs> and I'm like, are you sure? And uh, they were like, uh, they were like, no, no, take it off. Uh, we'll get you a second dance belt. Oh, so I had to wear two dance belts, which are... The whole point of a dance belt is to remove any semblance of gender, yeah. and um, and so I wore that. But then they they when that when Candy Cane Man came back uh, for more holiday episodes, uh, it was a completely different costume. So this year they nixed Candy Cane Man altogether, and I am a human gingerbread man, uh, and he is funny, um, but it's it's completely covered. You can't even see my face, so. Uh, my worst actor dreams come true. Oh. <laughs> it's like, oh, I mean, oh, if it, no one knew, it's going to know it was you anyway. But uh, I mean, if no, you would, if you would have kept that cup, unless they watch this, unless they watch this, yes, podcast, 
I was going to say, unless you kept that cup and then the, the legend would spread, Travis Ritchie is hung. No. Yeah, well, I mean, those who know, know. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I've heard I've, I've heard I've got MDE, uh, like, right, medium, medium. <laughs> um, hey, it's better than S, you know, SD, I guess. True, true. I am I am comfortably above average and I am OK with that. Uh, but the you know, I, I'm, I'm I love this job. This day job is great. Uh, There's a great crew. It's the most fun I've ever had on a job. And I've been doing it a couple of years. And so now, like, it's it's just one of these things that's so lovely. And when I have to go get a couple of days off to go do a TV show, uh, like a like a re- regular role, they do that for me. And so um, I can do that and then just come back. And the nice thing about this day and age is that uh, the pandemic made auditions all virtual. So oh. uh, nobody has in-person auditions anymore. Nice. It's all self-tapes, which is great because the old problem with doing really any job, but like doing background work or being a stand-in or whatever, was that, well, you're not available for auditions, but now you're always available for auditions because you do them at home when you get home from work. Oh, nice. It's lovely. Nice. All right. I'm going to let you go, sir. Uh, well, I'm going to let you let me go. You you have been at the light. Thank you, sir. Uh, promote, oh, the bo- pr- promote the book again. Uh, the, the, it's called The Vampire's Curse, Decimus Book One. My name is Travis Ritchie. It's uh, on uh, wherever you find your ebooks, and then uh, available in hardcover and softcover on Amazon and uh, available in audiobook if I ever get off my lazy butt and record the damn thing. Oh, audiobook. There you go. I know. I, I I insisted on doing it myself, but I haven't actually done it myself. So um, uh, I've, I've got this nice microphone. What am I using it for? Oh, exactly. Oh, you can do that from home too. Yeah, that's right. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever- saved some save some uh, uh, dinero renting out a stu- uh, studio, a sound studio? I mean, have you done an audio book before? No. Uh- <laughs> I've done some audio short stories, uh, uh, and I've learned a lot from that process. But uh, I think one of the things about audiobooks is that I am talking way too – like even my normal speaking voice, which I'm not a super fast talker, but I am definitely talking too fast. So, um, you know, if I were to read a book, it has to be much slower. So, like, I'll read this notification on my on my screen. Google Updater added items that can run in the background. You can manage this in login items settings. That's how slow it has to be. Oh yeah, the book. yeah. And I'm not. It's it's unnatural to me. Yeah, I know. That's a, that would be me. I'm like, oh, no, yeah. can I do that for a whole book? I don't know. Yeah, right. To force yourself to slow and be deliberate. But like, if you listen to audiobooks, they're so great. I, I oh, love yeah. listening to to the really good narrators. Mm, mwah. What a what a what a skill. So I hope to develop that. That'd be funny if you get a book and you get like, you know, like someone like Patrick Stewart to like narrate it or something. <laughs> I'll get Patrick Stewart to narrate my book. Oh, you got to write and a book. Bu- the, first, the first vampire turns to the second vampire and says, make me you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be even better if it was like your biography or something. It was Patrick Stewart or somebody write, or, oh, uh, man, reading so it. So many or- people I would love to have. I would love to have like a, like a, like a, Christopher Walken type do my oh. you know. <laughs> Travis grew up in a small town. Not many people there. Just a couple thousand. <laughs> I would want to know beforehand who was reading it because then you could just like put something in because if you knew if it, you know if it was Walken you'd be you just it, bullshit. It, you it just would be like and, that, and then in tenth grade I said I need more cowbell. <laughs> Uh, exactly. You know, I learned to do my Christopher Walken by uh, I, I included him, an original Christopher Walken character in my uh, SNL audition once. But um, I learned how to do it by watching SNL. Oh. And I would do all my impressions by learning by watching people do impressions. So like Christopher Walken was watching, I think, Kevin Spacey auditioning for Han Solo. Mm-hmm. No, Kevin Spacey was doing Christopher Walken auditioning for Han Solo. <laughs> So it was like, uh, ask ship. You've never heard of the Millennium Falcon. It's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. She's fast enough for you, yes. old man. Yes, I watch Saturday Night Live every week. I want to see you on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> oh, man. I That was my dream of dreams. That's what made me into uh, into an actor, I think, was uh, 10 years old. My mom pulled me into her bedroom to watch a church lady 
uh, sketch for the first time. And it's special. <laughs> yes. I remember that was like one of the first things I saw, too. Yeah, the church lady. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Who Who could it be? Who could it be? Could it be Satan? <laughs> Uh, oh man, all those, and I, I loved bringing those characters. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, your viewers who are watching the video can see there's, uh, I've got my, my good side lit, but I have Bell's palsy, which is a paralysis of one side of my face. I was born with it. And, uh, you know, when I got to the age where, you know, uh, teenage years, uh, kids are just tiny little assholes. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, they'll, I was trying to find any way to fit in and, and make kids laugh with me instead of at me and so uh, I would take those Saturday Night Live characters into school with me mm. and entertain my friends uh, doing all those impressions and so um, it was those early teenage years of discovering that through acting I could entertain people and become someone else uh, that's what got me hooked hmm. yeah nice yeah no, this is deep this is deep <laughs> I like it Deep thoughts. <laughs> a little therapy on capes and lunatics. Yes! Oh, there we go. I need a couch now. All right. All right. But kids, go pick up Travis's book. Travis, yes. like I said, you are a friend of the show now. Anytime well, you, you want to pro- anytime you want to promote anything, just shoot me an email. You have the email. Just shoot me like, Phil, I want to come on and promote something. All right. Well, or if you into the uh, inspector book uh, coming this spring sometime. I don't know. I don't even know when. But uh, okay. Uh, until then, if you haven't seen it, do the watch the Inspector Space Time. Uh, well, the not Inspector Space Time web series on uh, the Travis Ritchie channel on YouTube. If you just search for it, or uh, one of my other shows is called Two Hot Guys in the Shower, search for that, or Robot Ninja and Gay Guy. That's my first web series. It's great. You should watch that. Um, nice. All that stuff is on my, web, my YouTube channel. So, yeah, anytime you want to promote, let me know. Or if you just feel the hankering to, like, I don't know, talk of Spider Man 2099, let me know. We do that, dude. We do uh, that. Well, didn't they? Didn't they? I mean, I loved seeing him in the latest Spider-Man movie. Yeah, which was amazing. Uh, but there's, did they not relaunch that series? I thought they did as a as a book. They've been doing like a series of mini series lately. So you mm. know they'll do five issues and then they'll do like another five issue series and stuff. So I think there's another one coming in January, maybe. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. well uh, I'll totally chat with you again. Uh, what you need to do is assign me something to read. Oh, okay, like, yeah, definitely. Say, say, hey, this book's out. I want to talk to you about it. Uh, I'll read it yeah. because I love to do. Because I, I have not read uh, comic books or graphic novels in ages, hmm. and just like my, I mean, my podcast is the reason to uh, listen to music at all. Uh, it'd be nice to have someone assign you homework to uh, to read. I don't know. Oh, don't throw me the good time. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll I'll figure out something for you. Yes. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. All right, buddy. Well, thank you, Phil, for having me. Oh, no great. problem. Thank you. All right. Go out, get the book, kids. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> All right, kids. Make it so. <laughs> There's my ending.